so the next set of questions I would like to discuss about the endpoint, uh, whether you go to um, uh, hard endpoint or whether there are acceptable surrogates and what kind. What we have done in the past is really focusing on on hard endpoints. That that's uh, sure. that's that's quite clear. MI, stroke, uh, cardiovascular death, and uh, also some softer ones like uh, like revest, for example, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, based on the fact that this is what we want to to prevent in uh, clinical medicine, that's what, what we do the uh, the pharmacotherapy for. Uh, certainly, that has uh, some uh, some limitations, and we might be interested also uh, in other um, endpoints that dealing more with uh, uh, with uh, patients, um, with uh, well being, etc. From the patient perspective, uh, I mean once. That are relevant for the patient uh, from the patient perspective. I mean, you in the in the, um, uh, in the um, heart failure field from the very beginning, I think you had additional points that are uh, endpoints that are relevant. But it's the need for hospitalization, uh, whether it's walking tests and and uh, several questionnaires. So I think what we are, what we are really besides. Uh, the hard endpoints, which are certainly of value, uh, we might introduce additional endpoints that are relevant from the patient's perspective, in particular if you're dealing with an elderly population where the quality of life uh, may be even more important rather than living one or two or three or four years uh, longer. So I think we need more investment in, in, in that area to, to satisfy uh, the patient's needs. With regard to, uh, to to imaging uh, endpoints, I'm very much in favor of uh, a number uh, of those that have been detected by various invasive or non-invasive uh, methods and have clearly shown that we have parameters related to the plaque. I mean, it has been debated very, for a very long time and some still believe uh, there is no vulnerable plaque, but uh, by the way, we have at, at this time we have eight prospective studies that have looked into different uh, by different uh, um, uh, imaging methods uh, into different uh, um, criteria that all have been prospectively validated and related to increased uh, risk for uh, for outcome. So uh, those uh, could be introduced in, in further clinical uh, in further clinical trials. And again, coming back to the uh, need for uh, for enrichment to have smaller clinical trials, more of being being more efficient. Uh, this kind of criteria, in my opinion, might uh, might work because we have prospective evidence that they are predictive for adverse outcome. Yeah, well, uh, the issue is mainly the issue of uh, um, uh, surrogates uh, uh, and and making it easier for clinical trials is more relevant in primary prevention trial where the number of events is likely to be small or the duration of follow-up needs to be very long. And, and therefore, um, uh, is there any way out of this equation or we will never have the primary prevention medication if we really need to have uh, mortality and morbidity only as an endpoint? Uh, we had that in hypertension and we had the gigantic trials of uh, tens of thousand patients is this realistic in the atherosclerosis lipid world that we have uh, uh, mega trials uh, of primary prevention or shall we wait until the uh, surrogate is accepted by the regulators? Bob. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think in this top-down approach, let's get the regulators to agree to use validated imaging modalities for patients with monogenic disorders. And then we can you know, have a companion registry and perhaps a companion clinical trial of a lower risk population. But let's start at the highest risk individuals first and then try and see how that evolves before going to a broader population. But I agree with you, the number of individuals that one needs to include for a primary prevention trial is massive. And uh, at the end of the day, we all end up paying for this by higher medication uh, costs. So I, you know, support a more advanced approach, but let's get the buy-in for the very high-risk individuals first. Agree. So uh, I would like to drive you in another way to maybe make it easier for innovation and getting new drugs is the conditional approval. This always has been pushed back by regulators and my own understanding discussing with Norm Sargridge and others is that they don't have 
a simple way to withdraw a drug which doesn't stand up to the expectation after approval. So what is your take on this, whether uh, approval on uh, these kind of surrogate or biomarkers or early outcome and then securing safety in post-approval studies is something feasible. They use it all the time in oncology, uh, whether it is uh, a way forward in your area. I'll, I'll comment from the U.S. perspective. You know, if the FDA evaluates data for a medication with conditional approval and said that, that the therapy doesn't reduce cardiovascular events, whereas it may have had a favorable impact on biomarkers, perhaps imaging, the insurance companies are not going to reimburse for the therapy, and that'll be the end of the therapy. So that's the way that the marketplace will determine the decision regarding the continuation of a prescription or payment for a particular therapy, a failed therapy. Well, that's a very important point, and this is the very reason we insist on having payers for Medicare, Medicaid, CMS, and other health technology assessment at the meeting in CBCD, because um, we may have way forward for approval, but then for reimbursement and pricing, this is a different story. And uh, uh, this, of course, is very relevant to the kind of evidence which has been generated at the type of trials. So now mm -hmm. I can't uh, resist to the need of asking you the usual question about artificial intelligence, right? Uh, <laughs> there is no interview without having a question about this. You have tons of data. You have thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients in trials. Uh, you have clinical, biological imaging data. Where they're putting all this in a machine and uh, uh, you know uh, getting some answer, and especially when it comes to surrogacy, you can find out whether the magnitude of change in type of imaging is associated with the magnitude of a change in outcome. For example, how artificial intelligence is going to be helping in helping you? So, you know, Fayez, we had the opportunity to work with Ron Doe, who was uh, part of the faculty of CVCT at the time of the sessions that we're discussing. And in a paper that appeared um, recently, he identified seven different triglyceride-related traits. So you can imagine designing a trial with elevated high triglycerides enriched in individuals with these seven traits identified by, you know, machine learning approach. And those traits, again, were associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease. So as we both discussed, we can't measure everything. We don't know everything. But with personalized uh, medicine or machine learning, we might be able to enhance the population for inclusion in, a, let's say, a triglyceride-lowering uh, trial. Yes. Um, well, thank you for this, uh, because it, it, artificial intelligence is going to be everywhere, and uh, we are preparing for it in, in the clinical trial area. Uh, now, I'd like to drive you slightly out of the uh, atherosclerosis uh, focus and certainly still lipid uh, focus. Uh, it is the area of NASH. And hepatologists are living in their own world and uh, using actually potentially same drug that you're using, uh, certainly when it comes to a trial rather and others, uh, with the uh, claim that these drugs may be improving NASH on the basis of liver uh, endpoints, which are mainly biopsies. Uh, but we know that this is the same disease, and these NASH patients by dying from cardiovascular, not necessarily from liver, unless they survive the cardio cardiovascular event, then they may develop a cancer or something. But most of the morbidity mortality is going to be cardiovascular. So isn't that the same word, and how soon your area will bridge or merge with the hepatologist. Uh, any uh, one would like to answer this question? Uh, I don't have any uh, specific um, uh, experience in that field, although I, I know obviously NASH is related to cardiovascular outcome, there's, there's no question. And uh, um, what, what we certainly uh, could look at uh, is um, um, uh, drugs that uh, improve, for example, uh, or decrease triglyceride rich lipoproteins and uh, um, VLDL, yeah, LDL, etc. Um, might improve NASH and through this uh, surrogate might then further lead to a decreased uh, incidence in, in cardiovascular events. 
I mean, the the the, uh, the connection or the relationship has been certainly established. How close we are with other drugs, um, I could only speculate, but it's certainly an area uh, to follow in the in the near future. But uh, I guess Bob has more uh, detailed experience in, in that field. Bob. So in the triglyceride lowering uh, trials, we saw diverse uh, effects of let's say angiopoietin like three inhibitors, an ASO versus an sRNA on the hepatic fat fraction and transaminases. The ASO increased transaminases, increased hepatic fat fraction, whereas the sRNA reduced it. And when you think about hypertriglyceridemia, you think about companion diseases. With so many options available, Evaluating a therapy and its effect on companion diseases, these uh, you know other illnesses that could uh, be quite important in the uh, longer term, I think is very important. We have so many options available for different therapies because all the pathways that we can target based on genomic medicine. So thinking about the intersections of those uh, you know biomarkers or those therapies with other additions, be other conditions beyond atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, I think is important and will help actually guide in whom to use one therapy versus another. Uh, it, it's a paradox then actually uh, NASH trials usually exclude patients with ongoing cardiovascular disease. Uh, this means excluding the real target patient population. And in our cardiovascular trials, we usually exclude patients with uh, liver enzyme more than uh, to uh, uh, the, the upper limit. And therefore, we end up by re really living in very artificial world and uh, completely missing the overlap. For this very reason, we have developed a system meeting to CVCD, which, which is called Mosaic. And we are running this meeting with Arun Sanyal and Steve Harrison and Veronica Miller, the hepatologist. And the meeting is bridging between different specialties, including hepatology, cardiovascular, and renal. And actually about renal, we have done the merge and we have done the overlap when it's come to cardiorenal. Now, uh, the and, and, and with diabetes as well, and cardio diabetes, cardio metabolism, maybe at some point we need to come to the cardio liver, uh, you know, yeah. word. So I would like here to thank you so much. It has been a very inspiring discussion and I'm sure uh, the people who couldn't really attend the meeting at CVCD will enjoy reading your triad of papers in Jack, uh, which are uh, have been drafted after the CVCD meeting. And I hope they will be enjoying this snapshot of the discussion which we had at the meeting. Thank you so much, uh, Volgan. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Thank you both and have a good day.